there we go. Um, <laughs> burnout is just everywhere. Um, in addition to hundreds and hundreds of research studies published, um, it's in the popular literature as well. All kinds of um, offerings for assisting and preventing and, and helping with burnout. So um, burnout has been a part of my personal life uh, since my very first career back in the mid 80s as a public school teacher. I burned out in two very short years, left with a heart murmur, and um, it has cycled back through my life ever since. And I've, I've really um, been focused on helping younger faculty in particular understand it as not a personal failure, but more of a system failure. So I hope to introduce you to some literature, helps you understand all of the factors that, that contribute. I think we um, tend to take it as a, as a too much as a personal thing. Um, and in fact, that's, it's, it's kind of been exacerbated by, um, by some of the programming to help. Next slide, please. So there, burnout was first um, coined, the term was first coined back in the 70s by Herbert uh, Freudenberger. And um, he defined it as a state of mental and physical exhaustion because he himself was burned out. He was a clinical psychologist. He worked in a private practice. He also ran a free clinic for addicts in New York, and, and he himself became completely and utterly exhausted. Um, from that point, he published a really popular book in the early 80s, 1981, on burnout. And really, um, at that point, it became a, a very popular construct um, for research and measurement. Um, I thought it was interesting that the Merriam-Webster Dictionary has a definition for burnout, which involves um, exhaustion. Um, as a result of stress. I've highlighted stress because we're going to circle back to stress in a, in a few slides. Um, the American Psychological Association has a definition for burnout that involves the same exhaustion, um, decreased motivation, lowered performance, negative attitudes, also um, high level of stress and tension. And then the World Health Organization also has a definition for burnout, uh, identifying it as a syndrome. Um, that results from chronic stress. Um, and so those are theoretical definitions. Uh, next slide, please. There are also, also operational definitions. So just as um, the, that popular book on burnout was being published in the early 80s, Christina Moslock was also working on a measurement of burnout. And so the Moslock burnout inventory is the gold standard for measurement. Um, several years ago, I published, um, uh, colleagues and I published a reliability generalization study of the Moslock burnout inventory. And it is a very solid instrument. It's been translated into 47 languages, um, just hundreds and hundreds of studies that use this, this instrument. Um, it defines burnout as three factors, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and personal accomplishment. It's, it's, it's interesting though, they define uh, burnout as a high score on either the emotional exhaustion or the DP scales. You can actually have burnout, high burnout, and high personal accomplishment. And this is particularly true among professionals. So physician populations will often show high burnout, but maintain a high personal accomplishment. So it's so interesting. Um, uh, feature of the Moslech burnout inventory. There are a couple of other th others that are popular. These are more popular in European countries, but they are popular and you'll see them um, in the literature. The Oldenburg burnout inventory, it has two factors, exhaustion and disengagement. Um, exhaustion is just what you would think it is. Um, disengagement is distancing oneself from one's work. Um, the Copenhagen burnout inventory is the most different. It has these three um, factors of burnout. One, one, your personal exhaustion, which is um, characteristic of all of these measures. Um, the second work-related burnout is also uh, a fatigue or exhaustion, but it's specifically related to work. And then client-related burnout is also um, a physical fatigue or exhaustion, but it is perceived as related to work with clients or patients. So in the literature, this is primarily how you would see burnout defined and measured. Next slide, please. So I was 
a little bit surprised to find that burnout is also in the um, International Classification of Diseases. It was in the ICD-10. It's also in the ICD-11, but it's been refined just a bit. Um, also associates it with stress. So it's conceptualized as um, chronic workplace stress that's not been successfully managed. It has uh, three dimensions. Depletion or exhaustion, you see that kind of across all the definitions. Um, increased mental distance from one's job, feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job, and then reduced eff efficacy. Um, they, I, should, I should mention, it's not classified as a medical condition, it's considered an occupational phenomenon. So just wanna make that clarification. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I find this, this quote interesting and this idea, you know, you've seen in all these previous slides, stress, it being related to stress and it being something that needs to be managed um, personally. It's, it's the person not handling stress well. And I found, found this very interesting. Um, this quote I really liked, um, Arnold Backer is a person who does, um, we will see more of his models in just a bit. Um, so enthusiastic employees excel in their work because they maintain the balance between the energy they give and the energy they receive. Um, one study that I found, um, Chitani published a study in 2017 that studied the gap between your ideal life and your real life. And burnout scores were significantly higher among participants who reported, of course, these larger gaps. And so, you know, this, this idea of energy balance, I, I think about sometimes we think, um, when we think about burnout, we think about people who've kind of emptied themselves to give um, in a service capacity. And I think that the person that comes to mind when you think about a service, uh, a person who gave their life to service is maybe Mother Teresa. I think it's very interesting if you look at Mother Teresa's schedule, she literally worked in those um, Calcutta slums seven and a half hours a day. She kept a very strict schedule and she spent seven and a half hours working outside the convent, but the rest of the time was all in self-replenishment. So she spent plenty of time restoring this energy balance. Um, she was provided plenty of resources to cope inside that convent that gave her the energy to be able to go back out and do what she needed to do. So later on, we're gonna talk about some of those institutional resources that can be put in place. Stress is something we're not gonna be able to get out of. Um, a, a life without stress isn't a very interesting life, but stress can be facilitating or it can be debilitating. And so we're gonna look at some of these resources that, that um, help, help balance the stress in a way that makes it facilitating. Next slide, please. Um, so when I look at interventions, when I first looked at interventions, popular interventions um, for burnout, I looked at a couple of large um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. One, this first one done by Ahola, noted that he looked at, um, uh, they, they looked at 18 different studies and that had interventions 14 of them were individual or group uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Only four of those studies had any kind of organizational component. Another um, large systematic review specific to physicians looked at both, looked at those that had individual interventions and those that had organization interventions, and they found a much larger effect Overall, they did a meta-analysis for each one, a much larger effect for those that had organizational interventions and those that had just individual interventions. And I do think it's interesting, the World Health Organization that had that definition of burnout earlier is actually developing evidence-based guidelines uh, for the workplace. Um, so that will be interesting to watch for those to, to be established. I do think it's interesting that um, looking specifically at acad in, a, in academia, that leadership qualities of department chairs have been uh, significantly correlated with um, faculty burnout. And, I, and we'll talk more about leadership in just a few slides. Next slide, please. So, um, 
the research on burnout, like I said, it's, it's, it's um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies. It'd be impossible for me to summarize the entire literature, but I think this job demands resource theory is very interesting. This uh, model has been researched since 2001 um, in all types of um, populations. It's uh, subcomponents of it, uh, the full model, um, different professions, um, well-researched. And so here we are in um, 2020, and there's a lot of support for this model. I think it's um, a very interesting model. It really boils down to these two processes. So you have um, this, this process, oops, this process, uh, the one on the lower side of the model, um, job demands, predicting strain, that is um, a health impairment process. Um, and then you see on the top side of the model, you have job resources and personal resources that are predicting motivation. And you see some cyclical things going on at the very top, that job crafting, you see job crafting circling back into resources and back into motivation. And then um, you see resources also impacting this job demands to strain. So let me explain some of these, some of the constructs in this model. So job resources, um, as you might think, are the uh, physical, psychological, social aspects of a job that contribute to achieving goals. Um, these are the things that can stimulate personal growth or development. These are, for example, autonomy, um, opportunities. These are, these are meaningful feedback. Um, personal resources are more personal to, to are more uh, central to the person, that things like optimism or self-efficacy would be a personal resource. Um, job demands would be, of course, the things of the job that require sustained effort. So um, not only do they require effort, but they would also be associated with a physical or psychological cost. S sustaining that effort would, be, would have some kind of a cost. Um, on the top side, that um, job crafting that has that cyclical relationship with motivation, that is the proactive building of resources. So you can see it replenishing. You can see that those resources drive motivation, but that just like a QI process sort of works like a QI process, job crafting is a way of making proactive changes in work tasks or, um, you know, uh, team building, it, anything that could improve the way that job resources impact motivation is job crafting. And it works in a cyclical way. And, and the more that, that a person is able to do job crafting, the more they can engage in that process, the higher their motivation, ultimately, the better their job performance. On the bottom end of this model, you see job demands uh, impacting strain. A uh, strain is literally a health impairment process. So it's, it's independent for the most part from that motivational process, um, but it is a negative impact, impact on job performance. And it has a cyclical relationship. You can see the circular relationship with self-undermining. Self-undermining is uh, actually the consequence of strain. Um, and it has this reciprocal relationship with job demands. So self-undermining behaviors lead to higher demands, which then lead to more strain, which then lead to self-undermining. So it is a negative loop that you can get caught in. Um, this model has been uh, so widely researched that now there are interventions based on this model that can be incorporated into the workplace. So next slide. So these are several um, interventions based on that model um, being used in the workplace right now um, and with, with good, good results. So this job demand resource monitor, um, these job demands, resources, and well-being behaviors are assessed in an electronic survey. Participants can receive personalized feedback and benchmark uh, comparisons. So they can begin a positive feedback loop rather than um, a negative one. 
There are specific job crafting workshops that teach people about the model, teach people about job demands, resources, modification strategies, so that they can actively engage in that job crafting uh, loop. There is a type of training called VOIT, which stands for Burnout Intervention Training, uh, and it's specifically for managers and team leaders. Um, it is a face-to-face uh, -face workshop. Uh, there are four workshops, and you can deliver them over a very flexible time period of seven to 17 weeks, shown to be quite effective. Um, and then organizational assessment, where those job demands and resources are measured, they're aggregated, by either department or larger organization and compared to benchmarks so that uh, um, institutions can, can begin to work on weak areas. So um, definitely answers for organizations that are interested in engaging in meaningful work. So next slide. So another focus, um, is to take a positive approach. So there is now some momentum for the idea of faculty vitality, encouraging faculty vitality, promoting faculty vitality. So um, Shaw um, proposes that this focus on vitality is an effective way to prevent burnout. So in this model, there are three equally important factors. Um, those focusing on the individual, of course, which is some of these other um, involves some of these other constructs we've talked about, you know, motivation, self-efficacy, self-esteem, all um, associated with the person, but equally important, and two-thirds of the model are institutional factors, leadership, and, and then the institution overall. So, you know, we just can't dismiss how important leadership is. It's just, it's just critical that, um, our leaders um, create uh, an environment where some of these things that we're going to talk about, some of these additional models, can be played out. Um, there is a lot of research around transformative leadership um, and how effective that is in the workplace. Uh, one of the problems that we're going to encounter in a, in a few slides is that um, uh, as far as women faculty, we just don't have enough women in leadership roles. Um, and that is one, one thing that, that we really need to work on in upcoming years. Um, institutional, of course, is just the culture, the mission, the way that the institution itself promotes uh, wellness and um, individual wholeness. Um, so, uh, one of the quotes from this article was that strong faculty vitality is more likely, of course, when all three of these work together for a unified purpose. And that's it, that everybody is working for um, the same, toward the same goals. Next slide, please. I really think this is important. We hear and talk a lot about work-life balance, but um, in order to get to vitality, we've got to rethink work-life balance. Work-life balance is a zero-sum game. So for work to win, life has to lose. Or for life to win, work has to lose. So work-life balance is now being modeled as work-life integration. And this is important because uh, in most of this research, the major contributor to burnout is work-life conflict. So um, Chitani and colleagues uh, found, I mentioned this earlier, that this ideal life, real life uh, gaps um, are a major predictor of burnout. And it turns out that women have significantly uh, higher, larger gaps in their ideal life priorities and their real life priorities. So for women, um, they report gaps um, at a rate of 72% versus 54% for, for men. And when they rank their partner, real life priorities versus ideal life priorities for their partner, they also are significantly higher. Women reporting 71% reporting a significant gap compared to 46% of men. 
so women are definitely dealing with work-life conflict. It, it, it affects women uh, at a higher rate than it does men. So the concept of work-life integration acknowledges that there's no perfect balance between work and life. You just, this, this is, it's never going to be balanced, and there's always going to be a loser, a winner, and a loser. So work-life integration is persons finding themselves accomplishing work tasks at home uh, and tending to some life responsibilities while they're at work. Um, this can be assisted with technology. I think we've all kind of, COVID has kind of made us all sort of figure this out in a, in a little bit uh, different way. Um, once again, the key to making this work is leadership who not only embrace this concept, but model it. So when you have leaders that you see doing some life things at work and taking um, some work things um, home when, when it makes sense um, and doesn't interfere, you, you create a, a culture where this is okay, where it's okay to, to blur these lines. So rather than filtering essential parts of life identity at work, work-life integration allows us to come to work whole, as a whole person. We come with our life, our, uh, our life spills over into work. Our work also spills over into life, but that's not always a bad thing. Okay, next slide, please. So work-life integration um, literature research. Um, I found that the most supportive work cultures are associated with the lowest levels of work family conflict, even after controlling for workload found that work-life conflict strongly predicted burnout um, and mediated the relationship between work demands and burnout. Um, age, gender, children's age, and specialty choice uh, and burnout all significantly associated with work-life integration satisfaction. So uh, younger faculty had lower rates of satisfaction. Um, women had significantly lower rates of satisfaction compared to men. Children's age this is really important. So um, faculty with young children, preschool age children to early elementary age, significantly um, lower satisfaction. Specialty choice, of course, it's the, it's the difference in um, specialties that are associated with a more um, planned work schedule versus those that have um, higher demands you know, like surgery or emergency medicine. Uh, of course, burnout. Um, also interesting is that, that a supportive culture, so a supportive work culture can buffer women from the negative effects of work-family conflict. It's, once again, it's very important that the, that the leadership and the organization take some responsibility here. It's not just on the individual. Um, another interesting study they don't have on the slide but it was done by Jolly and colleagues it was published in 2014 they took um, physicians who had received NIH K awards and they surveyed them uh, these were all who still had active uh, academic affiliations and they found large gender differences in domestic activities so first of all uh, of the men who they surveyed, K award winners, were men. Only 45% of those men had partners who, were, who had full-time employment. The women, K award winners, win, uh, winners who were women, 86% of their partners were employed full-time. As a result, maybe not as a result, but, but another finding, women uh, in this survey uh, reported spending on average eight and a half more hours per week on domestic duties. So even among equally committed um, faculty members, um, there's, there's just a discrepancy. So next slide, please. So organizational climate and women faculty in, in particular, how are women disproportionately affected by these factors that influence burnout? Um, Women physicians who are in academic practice report significantly less satisfaction with work integration, um, work-life integration, 30% compared to men. 
and report higher rates of burnout. Um, departmental leadership is actually a predictor of faculty satisfaction and is an important element in uh, perceived support for women assistant professors. Um, the AAMC puts out um, a workforce report each year. Um, they feature different things and different trends. Uh, the one that was published in 2019 reports that women represent 42% of faculty promotions from assistant to associate professor and only 36 of the promotions to full professor. So we do have a real gap in women in um, senior uh, faculty positions. They also reported that only 24% of department chair positions uh, are, are held by women in the basic sciences and only 17% in the clinical sciences. So definitely have a lack of representation of women in the department chair position. Um, I love this quote. This was by, this was published by the Committee on Maximizing the Potential of Women in Academic Science and Engineering. It was published in 2007. It says, the problem is not old style overt sex discrimination, but rather unrecognized features of the organizational culture that affect men and women differently, which is reflected when you don't have significant women leadership. Um, next slide, please. So this is a really great, um, this is from the AEMC report, State of the Women in Academic Medicine, uh, published last year. And it shows a trend line running from 2009 to 2018. And I think it's interesting that this trend, these two trend lines aren't growing closer together. They seem to be fairly flat. So what this shows, the top line is men. This is the proportion of department chairs by gender over this um, uh, nine year period. And you can see that men started at 87% and dropped to 82% over that range. For women, um, they had small growth from 13% um, over to 18%. And then similarly, so that, that growth rate, by the way, that's about a half a percentage point a year. If we go to the next slide, this is deans, medical school deans by gender. You can see a very similar trend, very flat lines for men and women. For men, uh, the range in uh, 2009 was 88%. And then uh, by 2018, it was just down to 82%. For women, it went from 12% in uh, 2009 to 18% in 2018. So the number of women deans increased by one dean per year on average. So we're gaining one, one dean per year. So you know, those, those are things that go into institutional factors um, that influence how women are doing um, in academia, and specifically in academic medicine. Next slide, please. So a couple of interventions that have been uh, studied that are tailored specifically for women. Um, Grisso uh, did a randomized controlled trial, included three tiers of intervention, um, and showed significant improvement in academic productivity and work self-efficacy. Uh, this three-tiered intervention included professional development, included um, a faculty-led task force, to help change department policies, and it included um, institutional leader engagement, which is really key. You, you have to have institutional leader engagement for these, for these to really work well. UC Davis um, School of Medicine started a program back in 2000 called Women in Medicine and Science, and this has been very successful. Um, it's had a positive influence on recruitment, on retention, career satisfaction, institutional climate, so it's been, it's been very successful, been running for uh, now, you know, 20 years. And finally, last slide. So I pulled a couple of these concluding statements from a study by um, Templeton. So it isn't clear that burnout actually is more common among women. The studies are mixed. We have, we have just as many studies that show that uh, burnout rates for women are significantly higher than men as we do that it's about the same. Um, so it's not clear that um, it's actually more common or if gender-based differences uh, or if gender-based differences in its expression, such as emotional exhaustion, make it easier for to identify among women. 
Um, also, there's the idea that may be confounded with age. Um, we do have burnout is associated with younger faculty, and we do have more women in the younger faculty category. So there is potential that it's confounded with some of those some of those um, features. Um, we do know, however, so regardless of whether it affects women at a higher rate, we do know that the contributing factors do disproportionately affect women. So work-life conflict, low represent representation, leadership, et cetera, all of those factors that we've discussed do affect women uh, more frequently. And finally, institutions should allocate resources that can help women be successful at work, including career development, mentoring, and peer support programs. So, um, you know, and I, I think that all of this has been just exacerbated by COVID. Um, so you take all of this and then layer COVID on and, and we definitely have some challenges to overcome. And that is the end of the presentation.